Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Paul O'Neill, uh, and on behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation in our monthly lecture series. Uh, the subject tonight being one that every Kingstonian worth his or her salt should be very well versed in. Uh, the subject tonight is the burning of Kingston. 237 years ago yesterday, uh, British forces led by Major General John Vaughan landed in Kingston and burned every building in Kingston proper, save two. There was a one house survived and one barn. And if you believe local legend, there was also a brewery that also escaped the wrath of the British. Um, but this was really a national event, the burning of Kingston. In fact, it's commented on by none other than George Washington. Uh, and we're most fortunate tonight to have as our featured presenter, uh, Hank Yost. And as you can see, Hank is a member of the first Ulster Militia Reenactors. And Frank is very well versed in the military tactics and strategy of the Revolutionary Era, as well as the events of that fateful day in October of 1777. Uh, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you tonight's featured presenter, Hank Yost. Today is October 17th. Take a deep breath. You smell the wood smoke? You smell the oak, the cedar? Pretty fragrant. You also smell the burned linen? and other fabrics. Do you get the smell of roasted meat, over-roasted meat, animals forgotten in a barn? Yesterday, the town was burned to the ground. Before that, it was a thriving metropolis, the capital of the state of New York, one of the three large cities on the Hudson River, and now it's gone. It's not a terribly important thing in the course of the war that it happened. It is critically important to between three and 4,000 people who no longer have a place to live, something to eat, shelter from storms, the property that they worked perhaps a lifetime for, and also a real dent to the cause. People here in Kingston were not completely, but almost to a person on the Patriot side, and they called themselves Patriots. Uh, the other side, perhaps more conservative politically, loyalists, were known as Tories. Not too many of those around here, so the people who suffered here suffered many levels of uh, anxiety and grief. Is the war going to come to a conclusion that they had hoped for? Is there going to be independence? Uh, or are we going to remain under Great Britain? And then what will be the cost of remaining under that? Well, the burning of Kingston, while perhaps not a terribly important part of the entire Revolutionary War, is certainly embedded in one of the most important military campaigns that the British government undertook against the American colonies. 1777, the idea was launched in England, and perhaps it came from John Burgoyne or others uh, in his troop, that if the colonies could be cut into pieces and then defeated in detail, as at least the terms during the Civil War called it, piece by piece, that Great Britain could bring the war to a quick end. To that end, they decided that they would try a three-pronged move out of Canada, from Montreal down, where actually up, uh, Lake Champlain to the Hudson River, and then down to Albany, another wing coming out of New York City, uh, going straight up the Hudson, and a third wing coming out of Lake Ontario area from Oswego down the Mohawk Valley. When those three met in Albany, New England, the hotbed of, of those Yankees that started this whole thing, uh, would be cut off from the rest of the colonies and then could be defeated there and then in the south. Part of that is what happened to Kingston. Uh, just to, to recap quickly, and, and this looks like a fairly knowledgeable bunch, uh, John Burgoyne started out from the Montreal area around the, in the summer of 1777. Uh, it was General Carleton 
who was in command in Canada who had hoped to lead this, but he somehow got aced out by this younger flamboyant gentleman who had a lot of political pull. There were roughly 8,000 troops of all kinds, being they, if they were British uh, regulars or Tory militia or Hessian troops or Native Americans uh, came with him. So the figures go. Now, Looking around, I'm sure that there are people who hear, many of them who know a great deal more about this as far as numbers and times and dates and that than I do. Um, the best thing I can say is that I've actually lived through it under modern circumstances. You know, slept in the field, in the mud, watched it rain, said, hey, this is what the guys did, let's do it tonight. We won't go to a motel. And uh, fired the guns, and every once in a while, for a split second, felt like I was actually there. Like I could hear the musket balls come whizzing by, and then you shake your head and no, no, we're just back, and I've got to observe safety rules, and let's make sure that those guys aren't getting too close in that. But every once in a while, the thing that reenactors live for, you're actually there. So when I think about John Burgoyne and all these things, I have been there. I've been at Saratoga. Uh, I fought several recreated battles. Uh, I've been out west. I've been to Stanwix. I've fought there. I've been down the river, and I fought there. This was a huge military campaign uh, in its time, and it was extremely significant. As we would know that John Burgoyne managed to get down Champlain pretty well. Uh, he split some Hessian troops off um, after they laid siege to Ticonderoga. General St. Clair decided that this was an untenable position and he was absolutely correct. And he managed to get most of his people across a bridge over into what's now Vermont and to escape. The British were hot on his heels. They went and sent a contingent of Hessian troops after him and at Hubbardton, which is a pretty desolate little place up in the mountains in, in uh, Vermont, even today, they met the Americans. And surprisingly for the Hessians, the Americans were pretty tough nuts right there. They held them to a standstill till the uh, Hessians backed off and the Americans managed to escape. Moving along, Burgoyne sent another group to see some stores at Bennington. And, uh, John Stark and some of his compatriots, the people that lived out in the woods there, came out to a little place known as Walloon Sack, which is actually in New York State, and more than stopped them there, uh, managed to really lay waste to Hessian troops who were ill-equipped at that time to really fight in the woods, heavy boots, tall hats, things like that. Um, but they were pretty much shot to pieces. Uh, many were captured. The stores weren't captured, and Burgoyne was in deep trouble. Uh, as he pr progressed further, he ran, ran up against General Gates at Saratoga, and because of an unfortunate little incident which was uh, entailed the future bride of, of a Tory officer with him, Jane McRae, uh, it is said that up to 16,000 militia came out of the woods to avenge her death at the hands of some of his native troops. First Ulster militia was at Saratoga. Um, we weren't uh, we were guys who were kind of manning the works, the breastworks up there. Most of the heavy fighting was done by Continental Line, Morgan's Rifles, Dearborn. Um, but the first Ulster was there. And Battle of Freeman's Farm was the 19th. Uh, it didn't go well for the British. By the time he was approaching October 7th and they fought the second battle, he was in deep trouble. So standing right there, Burgoyne is falling back and he's thinking about whether or not he should uh, capitulate, give up, surrender. William Howe, who's supposed to be coming up the Hudson River, apparently doesn't quite get the letter from George Germain because it never quite got mailed. It said that uh, Germain wrote this letter telling Howe, you are to proceed up the Hudson River, in contact with John Burgoyne, et cetera, et cetera, like that. He was in a hurry to get out for a nice long weekend. He folded the letter up, put it in his desk, and it never went out. So Howe was left with some discretion as to what he was supposed to do. Uh, and, you know, being a gentleman and, and uh, up amongst uh, the, the royal level of people, uh, he decided he'd rather go capture Philadelphia, which was the American capital, and that would be a, a better choice. And as Ben Franklin said, Philadelphia then captured him. Barry St. Ledger, had a force, uh, not that many regulars, but Tories and Native Americans came down the Oswego River, laid siege to Fort Stanwix. Um, he had expected to find a broken down fort, 
Um, what he found instead was that the industrious Americans had refortified, rebuilt, and had a pretty significant uh, little fort sitting there in his way that he couldn't bypass and safely go down the Mohawk Valley. General Herkimer calls out 800 militia at Tryon County. Tryon County is a huge landmass out there at the time. It's the only county out there before you hit the wilderness. And 800 men marched towards Stanwix at a place that was known as Ariskany, an Indian word. Uh, they marched down into a ravine and right into a tremendous ambush. Um, I refought that ambush two summers ago. It must have been a really frightening battle. Uh, with fire coming down the sides of this ravine from all sides, taking cover in the trees, being shot at from the back, with nobody really to cover you there, shooting up into the trees, the Indians yelling and screaming, uh, people who were hit, wounded, yelling and screaming. It's where the, the story about you put two men together in a tree, the first shoots, remember these guns, which I've got one over here, this is the assault weapon of its day. It fires one shot as fast as you can load and pull the trigger, and that's all you get. So the natives, Knowing that, bang, man behind the tree shot, they'd rush him and he'd be theirs. Put two men there, when they rush, the second guy shoots whoever's rushing in, the first guy's reloading. So that's where I first learned about that little trick out there. Ariskany, the, the militia fought to a standstill. There was a huge thunderstorm in the middle of the whole battle and uh, they managed to hold things uh, pretty much as they were, limp back uh, to the east. But what really happened during that point is all the guys in Stanwix sorted out into the British camp because there was nobody there, stole everything they could, took it all back into fort. And when the natives got back and the, uh, the Tory troops found nothing much left in the camp. Natives were pretty upset with that because they were there basically to go get things that they needed. Uh, they wanted some loot. They wanted to carry it home. Uh, and then Benedict Arnold, who would have been one of the greatest heroes of the revolution if he hadn't tried to sell out West Point, got a fella by the name of Han Yost, of all things, it's my name. <laughs> and uh, he was probably what we'd call a chronic mental health patient in this day and age, but um, it was filled full of stories about how many of these American continentals were coming to Stanwix, and, and the term were used because it was a term that, that would ring true to, to Native Americans in the way that they term things, but as, as many as leaves on trees. So when, when this fella who, who was considered a holy man by the natives because you know, he seemed to be in another plane, came in and said that, that uh, this guy's coming with continental troops and as many as leaves on trees. The natives were, they were not fools. They knew that uh, mm, you know, this is not good odds. The whole thing melted back into the wilderness toward Canada and St. Ledger abandoned the siege. So there's two wings done and there's John Burgoyne waiting up, up there trying to figure out what he's gonna do next. Well, it seems that we have a couple of, of real interesting little things that, that happen as part of the story here. Uh, we have a, an English general down in New York City who's running the whole show, and his name is Henry Clinton. And then we've got American general and the first governor of the state who's up at Fort Clinton in Montgomery, and he's George Clinton. Um, that works into a little side story later on. But you've got two Clintons who are not at all related to each other who are essentially running opposition forces. Uh, George Clinton's over here on the West Bank. Um, Clinton and Montgomery, the forts uh, are over on this side. And there's another fortress, uh, mainly battery uh, of, of uh, cannon that's on Constitution Island, which is directly across from West Point. Uh, they open it up a couple of times a year. You can go down there. The ruins of those forts are still there. It's been owned by the federal government forever, so nobody dug it up and carted it away or anything like that. Um, that's holding back anything that may come up the river. There's a huge chain, as we know about the story about the iron chain and all the foundries and iron works around here that contributed iron to go into that chain, how it was strung across the river on, on uh, floats made out of logs and uh, how it got washed away a couple of times in the tides there. The tides right through that stretch, the river narrows a lot. Um, the first Ulster militia also happens to have a 24-foot road craft that we have had down there for reenactments. We got stuck in that tidal race one afternoon for half an hour. Had uh, eight people hauling away on oars like crazy, and every time you look at the bank, it'd be the same place, because that thing was, you know, 
you know, we rolled some more. We're still there. <laughs> and so it's, it's very, that's a tough place to get by. And with that chain, there was no way that that British shipping was going to be able to maneuver, even if the chain was broken, without being cannonaded from all sides. So that was a, a critical point. And General Clinton, George, was defending that with two forts and a few more guys from first Ulster militia, but also from the other Ulster militia res regiments. There's four all together, and the ones down in the south. Um, not sure where the second came from, but the third and the fourth regiments were from a little further south and more toward the mountain. They were down there. Uh, Henry Clinton decides that perhaps, even though he doesn't really know how dire straits that Burgoyne is in, he thinks that perhaps we should make a demonstration, good word, uh, up the river in favor of General Burgoyne. Maybe take a little heat off of him, uh, but since Billy Howe went to Philadelphia, maybe somebody can link up with him once he reaches Albany. Or so maybe the thinking went. No one's really quite sure whether uh, anyone was really intending to link up with Burgoyne or merely do something that would draw some troops away from Gates at Saratoga and make the going a little bit easier. Well, let's see. I will consult notes every once in a while, and to do that, I will put on glasses, because we're past that point. Comes along October 6th, British shipping about 30 sail, as they call it, about 30 ships of all kinds. Square rigged all the way down to bateau, which are road craft, much smaller. Usually, if you're gonna carry troops, you need something like 20, 25, 30 feet long, pointed at both ends and you've got your guys rowing as well as your troops in there. Square, square rig, you know what square rigs look like. That's, uh, that's a reproduction of the rows. Uh, the rows fought down in the highlands, Tappan Zee. The actual rose was a small frigate, 20 guns. It looked like that. Um, we had her at one of the burnings a ways back, uh, and that particular ship became the ship in Master and Commander um, that's when they had it. When they needed a real honest-to-goodness ship, that's what they used. Uh, unfortunately, she sits someplace out in California now, and uh, nobody seems to want her. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was the largest of the ships that came up through here. Um, the Friendship, a 22-gun uh, that Sir James Wallace used as his flagship, would have looked like that. He was uh, in command of those 30 ships. The first expedition, as it sometimes seems to be called, was directed against the Hudson Highlands. And that would be Forts Montgomery and Clinton and that chain through there. So down across from what used to be Fort Lee uh, and Fort Washington, and Fort Lee was right on the site of Fort Lee, New Jersey. There were two American forts that were stormed earlier than that. There were hulks that were sunk down in the river as obstructions to keep the British in line down there, which, of course, the Tories down there. Westchester County is notoriously mixed, Tory and such, that uh, while well, they laid those hulks out, the Tories were up there watching and saying, OK, you turn right here, you turn left there, you know, and that. So they had it all mapped out. British shipping knew for a long time how to get through those obstructions. So he sailed up, got through those obstructions, and he kind of, uh, well, he dropped anchor out in front of uh, Fort, Fort uh, Clinton and Montgomery. And on the morning of the 6th, he opened fire. He kept uh, those forts really busy, he kept Governor Clinton and his troops very busy with the cannonading and, of course, with all the artillery coming back from the American side, back and forth, back and forth the whole day. What he'd done in the meantime is about 8 to 12 miles, I forget which now, south of there, where it was out of sight from those at the forts, he landed his bulk of troops, three or 400 troops. Now, we're talking about uh, British regulars, and they're going to hike over some pretty terrific terrain in order to get to these forts and surprise them. Uh, some of the stuff that I brought, we're talking about each man carrying a musket similar, not exactly like this, actually heavier, a flintlock, and each British soldier is carrying one of these. He's carrying a bayonet. He's got a cartridge box, which has got 60 rounds of ammunition. That means 60 lead balls with powder and such. He's got a knapsack, uh, which is carrying any extra clothes that he may have. And he's got a bedroll. And he's going to march that. And, uh, 
in shoes like these um, with the half gaiters, which keep the dirt and dust out of your shoes and kind of protect your hose. Uh, he's going to march those guys over Hill and Dale to come up behind Forts Clinton and Montgomery. And son of a gun, they do it. By nightfall, the British are there and they storm the forts. Uh, we're talking about, we're going in but with bayonet. We're talking about five and a half foot gun with 18 inches of hardened steel, triangular, pointed on the end. Um, they fire their volleys. Uh, they drive the American troops uh, from the Palisades through the back and out. They kill many. They capture many. Uh, some escape. Governor Clinton fortunately escapes and tries to regroup. Well, the British go and take that chain and they cut it, um, save what they can, float the rest down the river. Uh, and they write back down to Henry Clinton down in New York City that the river is clear. There's you know nothing between you and Albany uh, but gates, which is a Saratoga. So the second expedition, as is so called, I guess, uh, is launched. Uh, General Vaughan, John Vaughan, is in charge of the troops. Technically, there should be about 1,600 of them. Uh, but, you know, there's guys sick, there's guys that were killed in the fighting. Uh, he's got maybe 1,200 effectives. That's still quite a few. Uh, Sir James Wallace is in command of the shipping. Again, he uses the friendship, uh, and that's his flagship, and they proceed up the river. Now, during this time, the people of Kingston, the capital of New York State, the hotbed of rebels, they know what's happening, and concern is high, to say the very least. Uh, this is a frightening thing. If you can imagine, uh, say, having been in France in World War II, uh, a civilian, knowing that the Nazi columns are descending toward Paris or wherever, that, uh, you know, that brings it a little bit more contemporarily into the idea of, of some force coming at you that is huge and overpowering, something you cannot stop, cannot resist, and you don't know what's going to happen. So they've held many a meeting as to what to do, and people are recommended to take what they can and to go and take off over to Hurley and to Marbletown to get out of here, uh, to take your goods, whatever property you can, uh, you drive your animals out into the woods. You know, it's, it's really hard for a column of troops to round up your cows if your cows are wandering in the woods and they've got to find them and all kinds of other things going through here. So you do that, you get rid of that. Uh, by the time the evening of the 15th comes around, British shipping is now anchoring off what's known as Asopus Island. They're just south. And uh, panic really sets in. The Committee of Safety, uh, meets. Now, the Committee of Safety is our revolutionary government. Um, there are parallels to that. I think we've probably all seen movies of the French Revolution, and you know, you got these guys that all look uh, kind of scurvy, and they're sitting at the table, and they pass judgment on people and such. But of course, us, our Committees of Safety, we, we were good guys. No, 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 no. We were just as nasty and vicious and such. This was a real civil war. There were people here who lived next to each other with differing political opinions who hated each other, who were willing to use whatever legal and non-legal methods to confiscate their Tory neighbor's property and push them out of town and if be they go to Canada or wherever they go to, you didn't care. Uh, this is, is really vicious kinds of stuff that's going on. So they're fearful, the British are coming. Some of these people who uh, they've been, uh, you know, particularly obnoxious, mean, uh, terrible, stealing from uh, are going to be coming. The Committee of Safety, understanding that, calls for 24 wagons to get the rest of the material out of Kingston if possible. And of course, the good citizens who have their own stuff to cart out go, mm, I don't think so. No, I think I need mine. Uh, having redone the uh, Committee of Safety meeting for the burning of Kingston many times, some of my colleagues who play the good citizens is very frustrating to try to get out of citizens who have dug their heels in and are going to save their own. <laughs> so the, the committee meets and they decide that uh, they better get the records out, they better send them down out to Hurley, get them out to Marbletown, get everything out of town that they possibly can. They've already been doing that. A lot of uh, military supplies have already been shipped out of Kingston up to Albany. Um, at that time while they're meeting, there's, uh, the tradition says that a rider arrives with good news. It says that Burgoyne is surrendering at Saratoga. 
and they cheer and cheer, and this is great, and uh, they, typical politicians, they award this rider $50. I'm not sure what $50 were, but if they were continental dollars, they weren't giving him too much, but they award him $50, which it took him a long, long time to collect for bringing that good news. And yet on top of that, they have the news that here's these British ships and all these 1,200 or 1,600 men are lying off town. The, uh, on the morning of the 16th, uh, the British open fire uh, on whatever defenses have been erected. We have a row galley, a large row galley. It's known as Lady Washington. Uh, a row galley is a fairly wide, long, flat bottom boat, and as the name uh, kind of implies, it's rowed. Long sweeps, one guy to each long sweep. Mounted on the Lady Washington, there's usually a mast and a very rudimentary sail which can be used, but you can only sail with the wind. So we're talking down at the mouth of Rondau Creek, we've all been there, we know there's not a whole lot of room. Lady Washington is there with a 32-pound gun. Now, at the time of artillery, uh, before modern times with, with fixed ammunition, that referred to the weight of the ball that that cannon fired. So a 32, you had threes, sixes, twelves, twenty-fours, and thirty-twos were pretty standard. So we know that Lady Washington is packing a wallop with this thirty-two pounder. She has got what's considered a pretty doggone big naval gun sitting right there at the mouth of the creek. And also erected along the Ponkonky area is a couple of batteries of lighter cannon. That's what we got. That's all we got. You know, it's not a big army. Uh, the militia that covers this area, the first Ulster, is either mostly at Saratoga and or down with General Clinton. So it's guys like me, old guys, boys, that are basically left to do this, to man the guns, and to try to do something to stop the British. Well, sure, we tried. Um, any of you who have been to one of the reenactments, you know that we admit right up front that we're working a whole lot harder than the American forces were able to when the, when the town was originally burned. We're putting on a lot more of a fight than they ever had a chance to. These are regulars that come ashore. Uh, they come ashore in uh, whale boats and in bateau. They're rowed over. If any of you happen to see any of the uh, early morning stuff uh, from two burning of Kingston's ago, uh, we actually landed troops at the, at the beach uh, down at the point. Uh, but they come ashore, these guys, you know, with the 60 rounds of ammo and, and uh, the 9-pound, 10-pound muskets with the bayonets and that, and uh, a couple of hundred of them take off directly and they attack uh, the uh, batteries that are down in Ponkonky. Now, if you can imagine, even then, being a foot soldier and you are, are heading toward cannon, uh, the thing you want to do is stay out of the way of the cannon. And one of the things that, of course, happens when he thinks you fire one shot and it takes time to reload and then you rush forward and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The British aren't stupid. Uh, they're very smart guys. The whole thing that, that I was sort of, you know, grew up on in grade school where the British stood in the big lines out, the Americans stood behind the rocks and trees and shot at them, and that's why we won, is completely wrong. Uh, we didn't start winning anything until we learned how to fight European style, and that happened at Valley Forge at the hands of uh, a general who was really no more than a Prussian captain of artillery. His name was von Steuben, and he didn't speak any English, and he cursed in three languages. And sometimes when the troops weren't really getting it, he would say to one of his uh, American cohorts who spoke French, which he also spoke, you curse at them for a while, I'm tired of cursing at them. And then, you know, the American would yell at him for a while, but son of a gun, those guys learned that. And when they came out of Valley Forge, they were crack European troops. But they weren't there at Kingston. And so the batteries down in Ponkonky were overrun. When they were overrun, the first thing you do when you're a cannoneer, that you're, you can't cart these suckers off. First, they're heavy. Two, the horses ran away a long time ago if we had any horses. And the only thing you can do is try to stop whatever troops are capturing your guns from turning them around and firing them on you. And to do that, you spike the cannon, as the term is. There's a long iron or brass rod at the top of that cannon. You know, you load it down the muzzle. You got to pour the powder down. You got to ram that in. It usually comes in a package, and you shove that thing down. The cannonball goes on top of it. Somebody takes this pick down through the hole, opens up that bag in there. That's a flash hole. You pour a little powder in there. You set it off with a linstock. Boom, and the thing goes. Well, 
one way you can just completely sabotage that is jam something in that flash hole. And that's the standard procedure of keeping the energy from using the gun against you. So as the Americans took off, they took those rods and they jammed them down the flash hole, broke them off. It's going to take the British hours and hours to dig down and pry those things out and get them out if they're ever going to use the gun. So that part is safe. Meanwhile, the Lady Washington is hammering away with no real good effect. Uh, apparently, they didn't hit much. And uh, if you have ever seen any kind of artillery, naval artillery at the time, the way that you raised or lowered the muzzle in order to shoot farther or closer was dependent upon this wedge that you jammed in at the back of the gun that lifted it or you kicked it out a little bit and it dropped it. Uh, how well trained they were, I don't know, but Lady Washington was doing her best, but that wasn't helping. The boats came up. Uh, they came up the, uh, up the creek after her and uh, there wasn't too much she could do except run. And she did, real well. Uh, she ran all the way back up to Eddyville, at which point she was scuttled. And why'd they sink her? Well, you know, you can't burn a boat that's underwater, but you can raise her up later. And that's exactly what happened. So they got back to Eddyville, and either they already had, I'm not sure how this is done, people who are sailors, more uh, reenactors who are sailors know the techniques, but you either already have a hole in the bottom, or two or three or nine, that's plugged, and you just take mallets and you whack those plugs loose and the water comes in and you get the heck off. Uh, and then when you want to re, uh, re raise her back up again, you send divers down and the divers got no tanks. They go and they go down, they put the plugs back in and then you pump the water out. Yeah, uh, that's how that's done. So they saved Lady Washington basically by sinking her so she couldn't be burned. Uh, and she was raised later on. Meanwhile, those troops down, which is uh, now in our Rondout area, there's only three houses down there at the time, and they burned all of those, and there were the hulks of uh, ships, old ships, that had contained Tory prisoners, and they'd been sent to Connecticut. There were, some of you may be aware of the mines in Connecticut that were used as prison. Um, you put those guys down a ladder into the mine, they couldn't get out, it's dark, it's damp, and you know, a lot of them starved and died and got scurvy and all kinds of other things. Uh, but most of those people had been sent out, so the British burned the hulks there, they burned down anything they could, they burned a couple of sloops, uh, and one British lieutenant uh, was blown up when unexpectedly a powder supply in one of those, uh, one of those boats uh, exploded. Uh, as a letter that followed up that um, he was not, him, he and his men were not blown up dangerously. So my conclusion is, and I think that the, the conclusion that they're hinting at is he wasn't killed, but he sure was startled quite a bit when that thing went off. And uh, that was, you know, that was pretty much it for, for any kind of defenses down in the Rondau. Uh, while that's going on, General Vaughan is landing the rest of the troops at what was then called Columbus Point, which from best I can tell is probably on the other side of the beach, kind of where the uh, brickworks were then and I guess were now. I guess that's the remains of what was there was brickworks. I haven't been around here long enough, only 24 years, so I'm not sure what was down there. But that's where he landed his troops, the bulk of the troops. And two nice ladies uh, from the Senate House a number of years ago mapped that out and managed, I believe, to get some grants from the state to put up signs as the actual route those British soldiers marched up here. And I assume generally it was along Delaware Avenue to get up here. Um, because that's kind of one of the more direct ways now to get up to, this, to, the, uh, to, the, to the village. And uh, they met up with the troops from, from down at uh, the Rondout, and they proceeded toward Kingston itself. Now, at that time, there was a notorious gentleman by the name of Lefferts, uh, who was uh, out of New York City and was a loyalist, a staunch loyalist. Not sure why he wasn't either strung up, tarred and feathered, or driven out, but he was living here at the time. Sometimes you could be wealthy enough that uh, you would have the protection of the king, uh, which means nobody would mess with you too bad, as, you know, as long as you weren't vulnerable. But he was the first person, apparently, according to tradition, who came up to Vaughan and said, you know, by the way, uh, Burgoyne's in deep trouble up there in Saratoga, and he's really considering, you know, he's on the verge of surrendering, and he's going to do it, you know. And, uh, from what uh, the letters and such. I'm using, uh, you know, if you can ever get a hold of the copy that uh, George Pratt, Colonel George Pratt, uh, his 1858 version of the burning of Kingston has all the letters in there. But uh, from what was stated, uh, Vaughn was then hopping mad because not only was this demonstration not going to do any good, 
uh, but here's this nest of rebels sitting here right at his feet. You know, he could have thrown up his hands and said, ah, well, you know, shoot, doing anything more is, let's go get something to eat on the ships and go back home. But nope, that was not his decision. He was really, he was angry, he was hopping mad, and he decided that we're going to burn out this nest and be done with it. It's said that there were men who fired on him, the remnants of militia, from some of the trees as, as the troops marched toward uh, the village proper. Um, that's a good possibility. Uh, there were militia yet around who'd, who'd fled from down upon Honky and firing from the trees and taken off is a uh, pretty good tactic. You know, you let fly, you turn around, run like crazy. When you don't see any behind you, you get behind a tree, you load up again. Uh, you know, you can do that over and over a few times. It doesn't have a great effect, but you can do that. It is also said that it's, it's quite possible, uh, there's a tradition that they grabbed a Negro man um, in the terminology of the time and made him show them how to get to Kingston. Um, I would suspect it was fairly obvious, but that's one of, the, one of the traditions. So they were led up, and at the time that the British troops were actually entering Kingston, uh, you might imagine it would be right about the point where Academy Green is. They were coming in there. The last of the people and the residents with whatever they had at the end were running out the backside down where Dising Bakery is and getting out of here and heading toward Hurley. Uh, so it was a very close thing for at least some residents who stayed to the very end. Uh, they pulled it as the British came in. They were pulling out the other end. Uh, British looked around. They knew uh, that there was going to be uh, some hot pursuit. They knew that George Clinton had gathered together whatever troops he had left and was hot on, on their trail, trying to intervene, get between them and Kingston. They also knew that Israel Putnam, on the other side of the river, had 6,000 troops, Continentals, but mostly militia. So they were more or less kept uh, to the river itself and to areas fairly close to the river that they could get back to and get back on shipping. They knew they were sort of penned in, they knew time was short, but boy, they had enough time to do their work. Divided up into small groups with torches and brands and such, ran from house to house, took whatever they felt they could, and of course by this time, you know, we're talking about a group of people who are known as frugal Dutchmen, uh, they probably cleaned those houses out with anything that was worth taking, but I can imagine a uh, British officer saying, oh, I really like that, you there, private, take that. I want it back at the, you know, that's the privilege of rank. But the British picked up whatever loot they could and they burned all the houses. They set fire to the houses, they set fire to the barns, they set fire to the outbuildings, they set fire to anything they could except for one house, housewise, that's down there just above the George Washington School. Um, and no one really seems to know for sure why they missed that. Um, somebody told me at the last burning of Kingston that we did last year, I guess it was, uh, might have just missed it. You know, it's a little bit away from the rest of the action and just might have overlooked it. Uh, I can't imagine overlooking it because we have a lot of trees in Kingston now, but when you burn wood for heat, there's not gonna be any trees up here. You know, you can sight for quite a distance. Trees are gone, you can see houses. So there's one tradition that there was a Tory lady who lived there who had some connections uh, to the officers in, in the British forces and therefore the whole house, not hers belonging to, but she was living there, that that was spared. Could be. Um, I've heard a story that she was actually a secret lover of General Vaughan. Eh, that seems a bit stretched, but yeah, that's a good one too. Anyhow, that house survived. One barn, I guess, survived. Um, you can imagine when they burned everything, any livestock that the residents couldn't catch. Um, I've owned cats, and when we needed to move, chasing that cat down was, you know, something else to try to get them in a cage. Unless, you know, you're moving with us, doggone it, you're not staying. Well, there's always some animals left behind, and I, I'm sure they either ran on their own or were burned in the barns, and that's where the, the odor of the burned meat and the flesh comes from. That, that would be hanging in the air. Uh, it didn't take terribly long to do that, to set everything on fire. Um, the uh, officers recalled the men, got all the stragglers together, and boy, if you've ever tried to handle troops, straggling is a, is a really an art. It's definitely an art. If you're supposed to be here and, and you're a private, if it looks good over there, I'm gonna be over there you know, until somebody tells me otherwise. And they got all the troops back together and they managed to march out of here uh, at the quick step I'm sure. Uh, one of the interesting things about the 18th century, to, to just digress a small bit, music is a very important tool. 
Uh, music isn't just for enjoyment. Music tells you what to do in battle and in formation. Uh, music tells you how fast to march. Uh, the drum beat, a standard drum beat, is 75 steps a minute. Uh, that's fairly slow by our own marching standards, but that was a standard. The dump, -da -dump, -da -dump, -dump, -dump -da -dump. If you marched with that, one, it didn't fatigue the troops too much, and you could actually calculate how far in how much time your body of troops would go. You know, in one hour, at that 75 steps a minute, we're going to be X number of miles. So if you got a message from your commanding officer saying how far away are you, you could say we're one hour away, we're two hours away by estimating that. Uh, so I, that's why I imagine if all this happened, according to the records, within about three hours' time, uh, if you've ever walked from down on the point all the way up to the you know, city and back again, that uh, it takes some doing. So these guys must have been really hauling it. They took with them everything that they could of value, which included quite a number of African-American people. This is a time of slavery. Slaves were owned in the city, um, and it's kind of odd that they would be left behind, but as the story goes, you know, there was no uh, British Slave Act yet. I think that was somewhere around 1805 or so where slavery was banned in Great Britain, and uh, that practice stopped. But at this time, those folks uh, were walking money, and if you could grab them and, you know, bind them up and make them march back to the ships, you could take them down and sell them someplace else. Now, these folks never, you know, they didn't get a break anyhow. Um, so those are some of the things that went back with the British troops were any black Americans left here. They got back to the boats, they boarded on, uh, rowed back over, and about the time that they were getting back onto the shipping, that's the first of the columns from George Clinton made it within sight of the city. Now, I assume the point that they talk about is probably that enormous hill that's over Port Ewan and Esopus there that's uh, has probably got a uh, cell tower on there now and some blinking lights, but that would be a really good vantage point to have your advanced people who are scrambling like crazy to get here to end up where they could see everything. They can look down into the rondout. They can see where the city will be in the distance. They saw nothing but smoke. So they knew they were too late. Uh, they backed off a bit, running back, you know, and telling Clinton that uh, we're too late, but he does manage to bring up the rest of the troop, uh, the rest of his people. After writing letters to General Gates, could you please send us some troops, but send us our guys back, you know, we've got a big job to do here, which didn't happen. After sending letters to Israel Putnam, you got 6,000 guys across the river, why don't you send us a few? Didn't really happen. So he was basically on his own here, he knew it. He pulled back, reorganized, and the British were going. Um, they did hang around a little more. Uh, because of a, of a prevailing wind coming straight in their faces out of the north, it was hard to get upriver. And if you were sailors that know about tacking, you go zigzag back and forth, and you only gain a little bit of ground as you go each time. But they eventually anchored uh, somewhere off of Saugerties, and they burned uh, Chancellor Livingston's houses and his powder mill and a bunch of other stuff. They burned some houses down in uh, Rhinebeck and Rhinecliffe area, and they burned houses anywhere that they could easily get ashore uh, without going too far inland and risking being running up against uh, George Clinton's troops. About the 23rd of October, uh, they figured they'd done everything they were going to do. It was pointless to go any further uh, up toward Albany. And so they packed it in, turned around, sailed back down the river. Now they, uh, they now sort of own the highlands, at least for a short time. There's an interesting little obstruction down by Beacon known as a chevaux de frise. It's an enormous one. Um, probably in movies you've seen these things. That are, they're kind of like X's with points on the end. They're about as tall as a man. There's a rod or a, a log that goes between them, and they point back and forth. It's kind of a makeshift uh, type of an obstruction to ground troops. Well, down in the river, uh, the Americans had sunk enormous ones, made out of entire tree trunks, pointed on the end, weighted, and sunk down in there. Again, there's got to be a way to get through for American shipping, and with enough Tories on the lookout, the British knew which way to turn back and forth to get through those obstructions. So they made it back down to the highlands, the chain is gone, uh, and they're back to safety. Uh, the American troops are now far north of them. Um, Clinton doesn't have much to work with in Kingston. Um, the houses are gone, the people are scattered. Uh, it's now time, um, well, if you, if you kind of go 
outside and you walk over to the corner and you look down at Hannaford, uh, you think that, you know, if I lived 237 years ago, I'd be looking down on a field uh, and there's no backup there. There's, there's no place I can go to buy, you know, a quart of milk, uh, no freezer to go and get some hamburger and, and rolls and it's not there. They don't have that option. So this is truly a bleak, bleak time. Uh, if you were fortunate, you had relatives in the area. No relative was going to turn you away. Uh, or friends that you could live with. Uh, or even strangers who had a good heart uh, and would open their door and bring you in. One of the first things that, that Clinton did was to, uh, we have our local guy here, Johannes Snyder, who commanded the uh, first Ulster County Militia during this whole little uh, battle um, here in Kingston. Uh, he ends up with the job of organizing the rest of the First Ulster and uh, getting troops released from uh, George Clinton uh, to rebuild the town. And, and they do begin right away. Um, they rebuild the city in an astonishingly quick time. Within about a year, I think, if I remember correctly, most of it is habitable again. Now, how the heck do we have these stone houses who were, you know, in the burning and they, they're older than that? And then the wood part burned. The fortunate thing is all that stone stays right there and intact. And once those workmen come and they hack out the beaming that goes in there and they put new beaming in and, and they uh, carve out other beams and cross braces and such, they can put that house back together with a little bit of soot, I suppose, around because some of the buildings still have some soot from some fire or another. And uh, a few burnings ago, when the uh, person house was being rehabilitated, they had the sidewalks pulled up. And we all went down there reverently one night and looked in there with flashlights and lanterns because there was a layer of soot under that sidewalk down about that far that could have been from Kingston burning in 1777. Might have been another fire, but we all like to believe it was the burning. And, uh, you know, as things go on, we know that Burgoyne surrenders, Howe finally gets it in Philadelphia, George Washington fights a couple of battles, Germantown, uh, Brandywine and such, uh, and he goes into uh, winter encampment. Um, Barry St. Ledger is safe and warm back in Canada by the time all that's going up. And that whole thing, that huge plan to cut the colonies in two, of course, colonies to the British, new states to us, uh, that falls flat on its face. It took a lot of effort and doing, but it fell flat on its face. And uh, we were saved for one more year. Now to zip back just a little bit, <clears throat> I said there's one interesting story about the conflict, uh, the confusion between which Clinton we had. There was a fellow named Daniel Taylor. Daniel Taylor was caught on October 9th down around Little Britain. And um, he was carrying messages from Henry Clinton down in New York City up to John Burgoyne at Saratoga, back and forth, back and forth. It appears that Daniel Taylor was probably from Kinderhook and been recruited into a British regiment. Uh, I believe it was the 9th Regiment of uh, the Royal Army. He was a first lieutenant. He was in civilian clothes. Um, one of the interesting things that the Americans did, and it makes perfect sense, is when they captured British clothing, they dyed those coats blue from the red, and they wore them and used them. Uh, this is a fairly light coat. Uh, you know, this regimental was uh, only issued once a year. You wore this thing until it, it wore out, and then you turned it into other things, caps and, and vests and all this other kind of stuff. But uh, you didn't waste it uh, just because it was red. Oh, God, no, it's a red coat. I'm not wearing it. Yes, they would. They dyed them blue. Well, they had a bunch of them. They'd captured a bunch of these coats, and they only managed to dye some of them blue. The rest were red, and they were just given out to the American troops. You know, it's just wear it. It's cold out. You know, it's October. And of course, these guys, being no fools, said, OK, we'll do that. Well, Daniel Taylor is carrying a message. Uh, and it, it's going from uh, Henry Clinton up to John Burgoyne. It's encased in a silver ball. That's about the size of a musket ball. It's got a little screw in it, holds it together. And he runs across these troops in red coats. And uh, he says, who's your commanding officer? And they said, Clinton. And he thinks, great. <laughs> Take me to your commanding officer. And he is totally chagrined when it turns out to be George Clinton and not Henry Clinton. And uh, they suspect he's a spy. 
I suppose he's been babbling along a little bit, thinking these are good British troops. Uh, and uh, as they kind of glance away and glance back, he's done something. Something swallows and it's down. And I guess it must have been one of those kind of things which was a, a way that spies carried things because they suspected that he'd swallowed that message. And so they brought in a good doctor who uh, gave him an emetic. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, um, you know, that was little things that mom had up in the medicine cabinet. <laughs> And uh, the, the way that the letter went, uh, you know, it was a purge uh, to go either way was good enough for, for them. If they could recover that ball, they didn't care how they got it. And he coughed it up, doggone it. Uh, and uh, before they could jump on it and grab that thing, he had it again, and apparently he swallowed it again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so George Clinton says to him, okay, tell you what, you either cough it up again, we're going to string you up by your heels, and we'll get it out of you one way or another. You know, makes the knife motion there. And so he coughed it up again. And inside is this, you know, this message uh, from, uh, from Henry Clinton saying essentially that uh, the Hudson Highlands are clear. There's nothing between us and you but General Gates. Well, General Gates was plenty to, between <laughs> to be there, but that pretty much sunk it. Uh, Daniel Taylor confessed to the whole thing, but he was not really what we would call a spy in this day and age. You know, he wasn't hanging out and you know writing down troop numbers and who's in there and that. He was carrying messages. But you got to imagine these Americans were totally peeved. You just burned the state capital. You set all these people adrift, uh, and we're not happy with this. Well, they've had this guy going uh, all the way from October 9th up until they almost make it here on time to the 16th. He has a military tribunal. Uh, and he explains his situation and the evidence against him. And like I say, it's, it, it doesn't look like the kind of spy that we think of as a spy now. But the tribunal says, guilty. Yeah, I'll bet you. And uh, they sentenced him to be hanged. Well, they, uh, they had to delay it a day because on the 17th they were still getting their stuff together uh, in order to see what was left of Kingston. But uh, the orderly books, Every, every day, each regiment can, has a book of what goes on during the day, Reveille, such such time, troops formed, officers call, et cetera, et cetera, wood party, water party, this type of thing. And you'll get down to the provost guard has one prisoner, two prisoners, ten prisoners, whatever. Daniel Taylor's name is on the prisoner's list all the way up to October the 18th. And then his name isn't on the list anymore. Seems that uh, out in Hurley from an apple tree, they hanged him as a spy, and that was the end of that little episode. So, as it turns out, uh, some of our beloved houses that were built of stone are still here to remind us what happened. And it didn't change the course of the war, but it was awfully important to us, and it was part of one of the major campaigns of the American Revolution. So I'll take any questions you may have. Do we have any questions for Hank? Uh, what happened to, uh, to the displaced uh, people from Kingston with the winter coming on shortly? Where did they go before the winter? My understanding from what I've read is the first thing they did was to flee to Hurley and Marbletown area. Um, I'm sure right there, you know, it's October, they probably set up some kinds of temporary camps were taken in by the local residents. But after that, it's my understanding that they had to find places like with relatives, sometimes scattered, you know, far and wide, nowhere's near Kingston. They may have had to travel to Albany uh, or across the river uh, to Claverick or any of those other areas, wherever someone would take them in. But it's as far as I know, they dispersed. And I understand, too, from reading this, that the good residents of South Carolina sent us money to rebuild Kingston, uh, 900 and some odd uh, New York pounds, as they put it. I'm not sure how much that was worth, but it must have been worth a considerable amount. Other questions? Yes, uh, what happened to the slaves? One story has it that they were left behind. Do you know anything about that? Well, I. The only thing I've read is that uh, some Negroes were marched off with the British troops when they returned to the ship. 
Um, a slave was money, slave was property. Um, the officers knew that they could sell these people again and they could make some money from it. Uh, if somebody said, you know, you want to bet $5 they took them or they left them, I'd bet they took them. That would be my guess. But I don't have any specific information if they were left behind. Other questions? You said that the only house that was left was the one down by George, the present George Washington School? Yes. What about our Senate House? The Senate House was burned. So, so the, what's there now is a replica or? No, what's there now is the rebuilt. Oh, the rebuilt. You know, the stone walls stay. If right. you uh, try to set a stone on fire sometime, they'll right. be there all day. All right. So the, those, the, the walls were there, they rebuilt it. You know, that was rebuilt from the original rebuilding of Kingston. The, the homes would have been gutted and then uh, the, all the wood, the roof would have been burned, and the stone walls would have been re used to, uh, to rebuild. The, the home was the von, that we talk about is the von, Steen, uh, von Steenberg house down by George Washington. There was it's said to be a barn that was probably located right about where Ulster Savings is on Wall Street. And the brewery, the story with the brewery is that uh, the brewery was located down by uh, where Dysings is or where M&T was, and that it said that a slave came and kept rolling kegs of, uh, of beer out to the troops as they came and kept them occupied for the time. And then when it was the time to go back, uh, when the troops were called back, they, they were just as happy to, to have been treated so well that they left that. That, again, is not yes. contained in the letters that are circulating around, which say there's all but two buildings, but it's a part of our local history, and it's, and it's great. So I'll tell you something, too. If those original British troops are anything like reenactors at the first burning of Kingston, those guys took over the Hoffman House, and they drank that thing dry. So it's a good possibility. You know, it's like a story that rings true. You say, yeah, you know. It, uh, well, I'll tell you, if, if, if someone starts rolling kegs out to me, I, I'm not, you're, you're free. I'm not going to throw rocks at your house. Uh, Hank, um, can you give us some idea what, this, what Kingston looked like? Uh, we understand it's a stockade area, but you indicate that most of the houses were stone houses that could be, let me just finish, that, that could be quickly repaired from the interior. But there were frame houses, too, and stone houses were usually associated with the, the wealthier people? The, the poor people didn't live in stone houses, did they? I have no idea. Um, I, can, I can tell you something about so social stratification that I understand. Uh, most of my education is as a sociologist, and a lot of what I study in history, I'm really looking for attitudes, values, social structure, stratification, these kinds of things. Um, Many of the stone houses that, that we have here in the city, most of the ones that I've seen, I would call Dutch-style architecture. I mean, it's a particular way that they're put together, the way the doors face, the way the windows are, the way the roofs pitch, how they're oriented toward the street. Um, those kind of houses, you had to have some money to build a house of stone. You had to have people who were going to bring that stone in. Uh, if you look at some of those houses that got those nice rectangular stones, it's kind of my understanding most of those are after the revolution as the quarries uh, really kick in, uh, but still toward the end of the 18th century. So you had to have some money to get all these people to build these kinds of things. Now a very small stone house a single man or family could put up themselves, but we're talking about a small stone house. Uh, and if you look at some of the houses in the area, particularly down by Stone Ridge, you'll see that a wing is a very small stone structure. Uh, and there's a wooden larger wing on there that got added at a later date. So I would expect that most of the stone houses were probably owned by wealthy people, uh, and maybe a, a few were rented. Uh, obviously, if you owned a house and you were wealthy enough to have a couple of houses, you could rent one out. That was one of the things you did. The poorer people more than likely lived in things that were made out of board. Um, you need a saw pit to make boards, and that's a whole other, you know, we talk about technology of the times and all that type of thing, but that, that would be my guess. Anybody? I was just wondering, with Kingston burned, uh, how fast did they relocate the capital? Who decided where it would go? I'm not exactly sure who decided, but it went directly to Poughkeepsie, along with George Clinton. Um, there's over in Poughkeepsie, 
Uh, there's a George Clinton house, nice little stone house, sits pretty much at the corner of Main and White Street. Um, I'm a retired law enforcement officer. I worked that corner. Back during the time when we got out of the car, we stepped on crack capsules uh, right and left. So uh, it was a pretty rough neighborhood back when I worked there in the early 90s. Um, but it's a nice little stone house, and it's a much, much better neighborhood now. And I think they've done you know, a bit of work on it to, uh, to bring it back. That's where the Capitol went. And then later on, it went up to Albany. They actually had met in Hurley, and there's, there's a story that they had paid somebody, we actually, they did, we have the records, they had paid a man to come to the courthouse and get the stove, the wood stove that was there. And he got it, uh, but he, I guess it wasn't in working order, sufficient working order, so it was very cold at the house that they were located at in Hurley, and then they moved ultimately over to Poughkeepsie. But it is interesting to note, as part of this, when we're discussing how, how we couldn't even comprehend the devastation of the burning of Kingston. Just think, every single house was burned. Right at the beginning of winter. We, and you don't have heat, and as Hank made a wonderful point, you don't just go down to the, to, to the Hannafords and get food, or you know, look how inconvenient it has been in the past when we've had some of these uh, hurricanes, how difficult it was to be without power for two or three days. This was an unbelievably devastating event. To the credit of the people here, they did begin rebuilding almost immediately. Uh, and they didn't leave. Some of, a few of them left, but by and large, the people stayed and made this into an, uh, an incredibly important city again. In fact, one thing we gloss over is that Kingston became the New York State Capitol three other times after. Uh, for short periods of time, but the capital bounced around for a little bit, but it did relocate here in Kingston three more times subsequent to uh, the burning of Kingston. Um, so it, it is, it really is a testament to the people of Kingston and of Ulster County to what they did. And as, as Hank said, the people of South Carolina, of Charleston, T South Carolina, raised uh, funds that they sent up here. It was like $1,200 of South Carolina uh, in South Carolina pounds, which, which computed to 900 pounds in New York, but just the giving, uh, and the, again, the Revolutionary War is being fought down in, uh, in the South as well. Robert Livingston, Chancellor Livingston, again, he had all his property burned. He gave to the residents of Kingston 5,000 acres of his own land out of the Hardenburg patent. Uh, it's in what's now Delaware County. In fact, there is still a town known as New Kingston in Delaware County. And one of the things that, one of the reasons that we know so much about who owned what and what they were doing at the time of the burning is because records were made of the inhabitants as part of getting property from the, this 5,000 acre uh, gift from Robert Livingston. They kept meticulous records of who was entitled to what and we benefited greatly from that. But there was a, an incredible outpouring. People from uh, Marbletown, from uh, Hurley, uh, as Hank, uh, points out, even across the river going up to Albany, they opened their homes to people from Kingston. So this was really a, 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 an effort that was throughout the Revolutionary War, people helping people. Uh, but incredibly devastating event, and you wonder, wouldn't it have been easier for those people when they did go away somewhere just to start anew? That didn't happen. Uh, and that's what's so, so particularly special about this event is that many places would have just given up. When everything is gone, everything you know is gone, you're starting from scratch, why go back? The war is still going on. Kingston was potentially a target again. So, but it, it says so much that uh, the people of Kingston did come back and did make Kingston into an incredibly important community. Do you have any other questions? No? <clears throat> I would like to apologize for getting into a groove and forgetting all about my technology here, but if you'd uh, kind of like to look at some of the slides quick. I would also be quite willing to demonstrate a piece of 18th century technology, my uh, fire lock here. If we all go outside, uh, I'll fire off a round or two so and explain some of the things that uh, went into being a soldier and why they did the things that they did. These are uh, obviously British troops in the, in the red coats. Um, great thanks goes to uh, Don Beale of uh, Rosendale, who uh, heads up the 16th Queen's Light Dragoons. He, he's always uh, 
very good about even kicking in some of his own money from a trust account to make sure this thing happens every time we do it. And he's a good guy, very knowledgeable, and a terrific speaker if you uh, need to get another one at some point. The British Army in America is, uh, during this time, is a, an interesting sidelight. Yeah, the, the Burning of Kingston is a community event. It brings people from all over. It gives us a chance to get them here to see what a special place it is. But it wouldn't be nearly as interesting if uh, the, the British forces came up unopposed and then set fire to everything. Maybe if they set fire, I don't know, but I don't, that's not going to happen. But it is a wonderful event, and uh, Hank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> And it, again, Hank really does deserve an incredible amount of thanks because the burning of Kingston is something that we all know so much about. It really is, you know, once you, when you start getting into the local history, the first thing you really learn about is the burning of Kingston. So it's difficult to really make a, a presentation on something that people know most of. But Hank did an incredible job today. I found this unbelievably interesting. I learned so much that I didn't know. And, uh, and again, I'll occur encourage everybody to go outside uh, as, he, as he lights the gunpowder and shoots the gun, because one of the things that people always say about battles, the one thing that you can't explain is the smell, the smoke, the smell, and all that. So um, I encourage everybody to, to go out. We would have loved to have done it inside here, but that probably would not have been uh, the best the best uh, idea. But again, Hank, thank you so much. Hank was a, a, a one, was an absolute pleasure. We didn't really get to, to touch base too much, so I was a little bit worried. I didn't know what was gonna happen today, but Hank did an unbelievable job, so Hank, thank you. Again, as always, we do want to thank all the people who, uh, who make this, this presentation possible, uh, you know, I, I used to read them out. It just gets to be too much. Jean, uh, Bob Rizzo's wife, uh, she does so much, and, and uh, she doesn't want to ever be listed up there, but she deserves to be. Uh, this, this list continues to grow. Uh, we, we got to a point where we just couldn't keep making it longer and longer, but there's so many people that make this such a special uh, lecture series, and most importantly, again, all of you. You make this worthwhile. You have carried the banner of our local history far and wide. You have made this into a successful lecture series, and you continue to bring to others the history of Kingston to the benefit of all of us. It's a very special place, and it's very easy to lose our history. It doesn't take long, so we thank all of you. And as always, I want to just let everybody know the upcoming presentations. Next month, November 21st, we are going to be learning about the Senate House, which is very appropriate because the Senate House and the Senate House staff has, has really made this into uh, the special series that it is. They, they, they bend over backwards for us. So it's going to be wonderful to hear some history about the Senate House. The title is the Senate House, Cradle of Democracy, and the presenter is going to be Dina Preston. Uh, from the Senate House here. That's going to be wonderful. And December 12th, we have Educating Kingston, the spark that ignited a future. That's going to be by uh, Anna Brett, who's a SUNY Ulster trustee. She was a former teacher. Uh, she worked over at the Zena School, retired uh, a short time ago. But we, this is actually the 100th anniversary of Kingston School, so it's going to be good to learn about that. And one thing that I learned is that there have been four generals from Kingston High School. Uh, that is, that's pretty amazing to me. Um, so again, we hope you join us for those. We hope that you'll go outside. Hank is going to shoot uh, something or someone for, for your entertainment. And everybody have a good weekend. We hope to see you next month. <laughs>